Hello, I'm Adi Janayandar and welcome to Next Tech. In this episode, I'm going to be looking at a technology that has its roots in the Industrial Revolution, but only recently has seen some giant leaps. Come with me as I explore the world of exoskeletons, where the combination of mechanical precision along with human ingenuity are opening up endless opportunities in our daily lives. I'm sure all of us have dreamed about it before, possessing superhuman strength along with extreme agility and endless endurance. Now, beside me is an exoskeleton suit, and it looks like something straight out of a science fiction film, but it is being developed right here for the real world. Now, imagine having a high-grade and composite materials as a skeletal structure on the outside, ready to shoulder any physical burden on the human body. Towards the end of the 19th century, the idea of enhancing human capabilities sparked an interest with inventors. Nicholas Yagen designed the first exoskeleton using compressed air sacs to power the device. At the beginning of the 20th century, Leslie C. Kelly followed Yagen's principle and designed a smaller device that focused on improving walking and running. Then, in 1965, General Electric attempted to build a powered exoskeleton intended to lift parcels of more than half a ton. But the concept of exoskeletons really entered the mainstream after being focused in many Hollywood blockbusters. While Tom Cruise's character in The Edge of Tomorrow is part of a battalion whose troops are all wearing exoskeletons and battling an alien army, developing a full body suit that meets the needs of today's real soldiers has proven challenging. Most of the early models developed by the US military require the exoskeleton to be tethered to the power source, making them bulky as well as logistically and operationally inefficient. And this is where the technology branched off. Nowadays, exoskeletons are generally classified as active or passive. Active exoskeletons use drive systems such as motors, hydraulic or pneumatic systems to enhance human strength or reduce the body's energy consumption. They are composed of electrical motors that actively augment power to the human body. Whereas passive exoskeletons are not motorized and often use elastic materials to store and release energy during activity. They do not use a power source, but use materials like springs or dampers to store energy and release it when required. Interact Technologies is a Turkish company that is betting on passive exoskeletons. They design all the components using engineering software. Then it goes into production before a working prototype is manufactured. So now it's time to test the product. I'm about to get into uh, Interact Technologies passive exoskeleton. Osan is an engineer with the company and he's gonna help me out. So first, I'm gonna put this around my waist. There is a clip here. Tell me if I'm doing this right. Yeah. And then it actually feels a bit heavy for the moment, but we'll see. There's years of research and development that goes into the development of a product like this, so to protect certain propriety technologies, Osan has wrapped my ankles in gaiters, but that won't limit my ability to move around. Once I'm all strapped in, I pivot around to take a couple of steps to see how it feels and to orient myself. Time to see how this works. Walking around in the exoskeleton, my initial reaction is that it's impeding my natural movement, but with each step, it does get a bit easier. Now, I've only spent a couple of minutes in the exoskeleton, and while I clearly can see some of the benefits, it's gonna take some time to get used to. I'm gonna hand it over to Osan, 
who can really show us the benefits and the full mobility of the system. In addition to what I tried on, Ozhan has a fully loaded backpack and a ballistic vest on him, bringing the total added weight to over 40 kilograms. And as you can see, whether it's hip rotations or front lunges with twists, the user of an exoskeleton is able to perform these actions with complete ease. But most of this was on flat ground. So what about traversing over uneven or steep terrain? Ozan demonstrates this by walking up a flight of stairs. And once again, despite carrying half his body weight, his movements are smooth and almost effortless. For anyone who has walked downhill, we know very well that your knees come under tremendous strain. Compressive forces are bearing down on you and your knees know it. But the passive exoskeleton is able to redistribute that burden and turn the strenuous task into a leisurely downhill stroll. I feel good, but of course, uh, when you first dressed up, you feel uh, you might feel a little strange and a little tight, maybe. It's like wearing new shoes, you know. Uh, but after a while, you get used to it, and you notice that the equipment doesn't limit your movements. Uh, you just have to get used to it. Interact Technologies has secured a contract with Turkey's Presidency of Defense Industries, which oversees the supply of military technology to the country's armed forces. Two prototypes have been delivered and are currently undergoing further testing. To get a better understanding of what goes into developing exoskeletons and the realm of possibilities, I sat down with Alpad Adigin, who's the Chief Technology Officer with Interact Technologies. And I began by asking him how the company was established. We are an um, academic company. We are a spin-off from Sabancı University. And we've been working on exoskeleton technologies, robotic technologies for the last 15 years in our laboratory. And in 2015, we decided, to, decided that our technologies should uh, reach people by becoming products. And uh, we established Interact Technologies at Technopark Istanbul. So you say there's a desire to actually get your products uh, out to the public, to the consumer. How does that work? Talk to us about that, that so transition. Actually, it's a really long process because when you develop some technology at the lab, you use the best components, you use uh, everything to be used only one time or a few times, but becoming a product is really difficult because you need to now uh, just ob uh, obey certain rules and certifications. You have to, like in medical uh, devices sector, there is um, this uh, CE mark and also ISO certificates that you need to have before having a product on the market. But the potential wide-ranging use of exoskeletons in the medical sector cannot be overlooked. One area where this technology is seeing great benefits is for the recovery and rehabilitation of people involved in life-threatening accidents like car crashes. And as our society ages, care for the elderly with tasks such as assisted walking, which will greatly improve the quality of life. But the applications are not limited to these children with cerebral palsy, they cannot really control their uh, joints like the knees. So you can, uh, restriction of the joints is very essential in that context. Also we work with the neurological patients like people who suffered from stroke. So in, on the, in that field we have active exoskeletons, we have motors because uh, a stroke patient cannot move like if it's uh, he or she has a um, stroke on her arm, she cannot move her arm. So what we do is we generate the healthy patient uh, person's arm movement and guide the patient with them. Besides medical and military applications, uh, where do you see this technology possibly expanding? Into? Actually, this has a huge potential in the industry, like the automotive industry, where the people carry how high loads, heavy loads. So, like if you're if you have a tool that weighs three kilograms and you're all working like this, your arms are hanging over uh, like eight hours a day. The three kilograms load is not really heavy, but after a half an hour, it becomes very heavy. So what we have is the exoskeleton arm supports to carry the load. 
So I, I tried on this passive exocell, and, and I have to tell you the truth, it, it wasn't a very natural fit. How do you actually uh, sort of cut down on the transition time in terms of getting used to it? There is an adaptation time with this exoskeleton. It's in the literature, it's uh, around three or four weeks. So like for the first time you wear the exoskeleton, you say, okay, I cannot move in this. For the, in the next 15 minutes, you can do, okay, I can, also, I can also run in this system or squats and maybe I can crawl. And in two weeks, you can do everything you can do without the exoskeleton. So there is an adaptation process because it's a novel technology. We are not used to having a auxiliary skeleton systems on our system. It's like first time riding a bike. This is what we have today. Uh, talk to us about how you see some of the features on this passive exoskeleton changing and perhaps morphing with other materials. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this passive exoskeleton has a really uh, a nice uh, property actually. It can be arranged from 170 to 190 centimeters height of humor. So therefore we have a bulky structure here. What we want to, so this is our like the second prototype. What we are aiming for the future is we want to make everything slimmer and it will be more like transparent to the user in the future. Tell me where you see this sector in your company in the next 15 years. Uh, the main problem in the industry is still batteries. Like if we, the battery power is really limited and uh, they are really heavy right now. So I'm not talking about the passive one in this context, but if we have lighter batteries and lighter motors, we can have like exoskeletons can, can be used like three or four weeks on the field. And this will be an advancement. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. So often as it is with new technologies, providing solutions to the military is usually the first step in and testing grounds. But for it to become scalable, it needs to expand into the real world. And that's exactly what the exoskeleton offers, from providing assistance to troops on the battlefield to medical applications. Who knows how far this technology will go. I'm Adi Jamayandash, and I'll see you here next time on Next Time.